bourgeois society stands at the crossroads. Either transition to socialism or regression into barbarism. Those words echoed down the ages as a prophecy and as a challenge. They were written over a hundred years ago by a middle-aged woman in a freezing German jail cell. A woman who would go on to leave an indelible mark on history. Rosa Luxemburg was a radical, a rabble-rouser and a revolutionary. She was one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century, and her calls for freedom, socialism and democracy scandalised people at the time, both from the left and the right. So who was this woman whose passion for revolution and justice sent shockwaves throughout German society, whose thought continues to influence millions around the world today? I'm here in Berlin, a hundred years after her death, to find out. All accounts of her both praising and damning agree on one thing, the fact that she lived a truly extraordinary life, especially for a woman of her time. She was Polish, she was Jewish, she was an immigrant, she was a political refugee, she was disabled, she was a socialist. There were so many strikes against her name that should have kept her on the margins, that should have shut her up, but she never shied away from speaking her mind, especially to people who were considered her social superiors. The Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is the home to archives charting her life, work and legacy. She was born in 1871 into a lower middle class family in Poland, then part of the vast Russian Empire. This was a time of pogroms, violent union busting and socialists being hung in the street. As a teenager, her left wing loyalties caught the attention of the police and she was forced to flee the country. She earned a doctorate in economics and eventually found her way to Germany. There she joined the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, which at the time was a mass movement. She quickly cemented a reputation as an impressive public speaker, a tireless organiser, an activist, an educator and a pioneering thinker. Rosa Luxemburg was an extremely prolific figure. She was also an extremely um, charismatic leader of the socialist movement and her contribution goes in many directions. So I would say there's three areas in which um, Luxembourg's work is important. The economic study of capitalism in connection to imperialism, the political study of socialism and the relationship to the national question. What makes Rosa Luxemburg such an original contributor to economics and to Marxist thought? She says that the way in which um, capitalism enters into contradictions and the reasons, the conditions for the accumulation of capital have to do with the fact that capital expands to extra European markets. So faced with the crisis of overproduction and underconsumption within their domestic advanced capitalist markets, capitalists seek for investment opportunities abroad. And they do this by finding markets that have not been conquered by capital yet. And this connects Luxembourg's economic analysis to one of her main contributions to the study of Marxism, which is the link between the analysis of the crisis of capitalism and imperialism, imperialist wars. Rosa's economic work charted capitalism's drive to conquer and cannibalize more territory, fueling war and destroying the environment. So for her, socialism was always bound up with the struggle against colonialism. This thinking solidified a firmly internationalist outlook. Whilst many of her peers were throwing themselves into national liberation struggles, Rosa Luxemburg dismissed this as a kind of bourgeois distraction, focused on securing a handful of short-term gains for a handful of relatively privileged workers while just leaving everyone else in the dust. And moreover, if capitalism is a global system of global destruction, only global solidarity can hope to provide any solution. Luxembourg argued we can't live in a world where capitalism is rendering life literally unlivable, so it's on us to change it. Here in Kreuzberg, I attended the Homage to Rosa Luxembourg conference, where leading scholars gathered with people from all walks of life to celebrate Rosa's legacy. Ich habe inzwischen fast den Eindruck, Revolutionen äh, finden eher in der Marketingindustrie statt, sind eher ähm, das, was uns heute das Kapital erzählt, das Revolution äh, in Düften, bei beispielsweise Kosmetik oder die Revolution in der zwischenmenschlichen Kommunikation bei Digitalem und Internet. Ich glaube, dass Rosa Luxemburg viel mehr bei Transformation als Gedanken war, als Überlegung war, als bei der Vorstellung, es würde einen großen Knall geben, 
und danach wären alle Widersprüche weg und das Proletariat wäre befreit und der Sozialismus kommt über uns alle. Und deswegen glaube ich, dass wir, wenn wir über Revolutionen heute reden, dann doch eher in einem dauerhaften, in einem transformatorischen Sinne, in einem, der immer wieder neue Bewegungen, neue Selbstkorrektur, permanentes Lernen braucht. Around the turn of the century, as the SPD were beginning to make gains in Parliament, some prominent leaders like Edward Bernstein started to distance themselves from the militancy of some of the membership. They pushed for gradual wins and cooperation with capital instead of revolution. Rosa Luxemburg took them to task for this approach, sparking the now famous Bernstein debate. She argued that whilst reforms are important, abandoning revolutionary goals altogether means propping up a system fundamentally geared towards the destruction of life. The Bernstein debate was very important because with this debate she became famous in the German Social Democratic Party. The Bernstein debate was the starting point of developing step by step later a new type of left politics from below, from the social movements, from um, self-organization, from a new understanding. You see Lenin, Kautsky and all the other thought we should bring the right uh, consciousness into the masses. She had a totally different view. The masses, by their own practice, will develop and we should help them to develop their own consciousness. She believed that real liberation and real socialism had to be grounded in the kind of self-enlightenment and self-education and class consciousness that came from ordinary working people engaging directly in struggle. Socialism couldn't come from the top. Socialism had to come from the kind of power that remains with the masses. This kind of thinking is grounded in the staunch conviction that socialism and democracy are fundamentally interconnected and fundamentally inseparable. Socialism without democracy is just tyranny by another name. And democracy without socialism is just a kind of sham, hollow liberation for a tiny privileged minority. Peter Hudis is one of the leading experts on Rosa Luxemburg's life and work. We live in a time where the language of freedom is so often captured by the right and especially the neoliberal right. So in contrast to that, what did freedom mean for Rosa Luxemburg and the socialists around her? Luxemburg was a firm a supporter and advocate of democracy, including liberal democracy. Um, she argued that a liberal democratic, what we might call a democratic republic, is the best form in which to carry out the class struggle. Because if workers cannot organize openly, if they cannot form trade unions, if they cannot fight for improvements in their everyday conditions, if they're subjected to dictatorial or authoritarian conditions in which this kind of political mobilization is not possible, it's going to make it much harder to agitate against the system. And in fact, when you look at the history of the 19th and the 20th century, the extent that we have vestiges of democratic rights is as a result of these social struggles. Um, but that didn't mean that Luxembourg thought that democracy within the framework of capitalism could possibly be actualized. But she really was one of the most thoroughgoing uh, supporters of uh, and advocates of democracy within the Marxist tradition. But she understood that um, uh, you don't turn your back. You, you try to use the democratic rights to the extent you have them within a bourgeois society, but you use them to surpass the confines of bourgeois society at the same time. Rosa Luxemburg had absolutely no patience with the feminism of upper-class women, which she saw as an attempt to elevate themselves to the status of rich white men, whilst leaving their fellow women to rot in factories and die in childbirth. Rather, she believed that gender justice and sexual liberation had to be undergirded by economic justice and economic equality. Dana Mills is a lecturer, activist and dancer currently writing a book on Rosa Luxemburg. I caught up with her after one of her performances to talk about Rosa's much debated relationship with the so-called woman question, the nature of women's oppression under capitalism. Rosa Luxemburg was a woman living in a very unequal time. She never had access to a lot of resources that her male comrades had, and sexism were used, was used against her often in the party, including from her very close male comrades, and she was aware of that. However, she goes against what was then considered bourgeoisie feminism, which is feminism focused on only on legal rights, 
So at that time, we're talking about the struggles to get the right to vote, struggle to get women into education. She understands that legal rights are really important, but they're only a part of the holistic being of a human being. So she never puts that at the forefront of her struggle. At the same time, it's really untrue and insincere, I think, to say that she was not interested in the woman question and she didn't understand that with regards to herself. She was very much in solidarity with her woman comrades. You can see how she's really working hard to elevate her woman comrades and to sort of create this kind of sisterhood working together. She writes, as I said, a lot about the patriarchy and how oppression starts really from minute structures within society. And she engages with that in various places in her writing throughout her life. So. I think she has a lot of things to teach us about what it means to be a feminist today. So it's feminism away from the, the kind of Hillary Clinton-esque uh, putting yourself against everyone else. It's very much working in concert with other people. It's very much thinking about holistic struggles as connected to each other. And I think basically the most important lesson is you can never talk about the woman question, the feminist question, disengage from anything else happening in society. It always has to be a, a holistic struggle. Rosa remained a committed member of the SPD for much of her life, but the ideological rifts between herself and the leadership steadily deepened. In 1914, the competing imperial forces of Europe were gearing up for the bloodiest conflict the world had ever seen, and SPD politicians voted alongside the government, passing war credits and calling off strikes and worker mobilizations to support the war effort. For Rosa, this represented a deep and fundamental betrayal of the movement. She and her comrade Karl Liebknecht spent the war at the forefront of the peace movement, and their anti-war agitation eventually landed them in jail. They finally broke from the SPD and founded the Spartacus League, which later became the German Communist Party. Julia Damphouse is a researcher who runs a series of reading groups with Jacobin magazine. I caught up with her on a characteristically rainy Berlin day. So Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and others on the left of the SPD had a really strong commitment to anti-militarism. And this came from like what ends up being a very intuitive concept, which is like, well, what causes wars at that time, and arguably still now, um, the desire for like expanding capitalist enterprise, so imperialism. Their anti-militarism came from this like critique of the function of capitalism, of that function of capitalism, and also just the simple fact that when you go to war, who fights against each other? It's the children of the working class who have more in common with each other than with their national bourgeoisie, uh, who are the people kind of precipitating this whole thing. The peace movement grew in strength as the effects of the war really began to bite. The dead piled up, the violence at the imperial frontiers began to return home, and Germany's economy steadily started to crumble. It was in these conditions that Rosa Luxemburg prophesied that a clear choice lay ahead for humanity, either socialism or barbarism. Popular discontent was mounting. A series of mass strikes for peace began in January 1918 and eventually ended in the collapse of the German front in October of that year. Then, a series of sailor and soldier mutinies beginning in Kiel spilled over into a full-blown uprising on November the 8th. The Kaiser abdicated and Germany was declared a republic. Rosa was released from prison the very next day and she threw herself into the fight, going to meetings, organising shop stewards, and she also published a daily newspaper called Die Rote Fahne, The Red Flag. This one is a call out to the proletariat of all lands. It's really, really hard to underestimate the importance of these kinds of newspapers and publications to the revolutionaries at the time, as this was pretty much the only way in which people had to communicate to organize themselves when the government was steadily assembling to try and quash the revolution, to try and smother it in the cradle. The SPD stepped in to prop up the collapsing state, forming Europe's first social democratic government. Its leader, Friedrich Ebert, was now chancellor, and the party worked together with other politicians, with the military and with the police to quell the revolution by force. The Spartacus group around Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, which had campaigned against the war illegally throughout the war, wanted to continue the revolution, or at least certainly not lose those gains that they had made in November, December, at the time of the revolutionary uprising. And so the Spartacists, together with other revolutionaries, stayed on the streets. They armed themselves, they occupied newspaper offices to pump out pamphlets demanding much more dramatic transformation than the SPD was prepared to offer. In the chaos of the days that followed, government forces rolled in and crushed the nascent insurgency. 
Rosa and Carl were forced into hiding, and on the evening of January 15th, 1919, they were discovered by right-wing paramilitaries, who separated them, tortured them, and finally killed them. Karl Liebknecht was killed here in the dark uh, uh, Tiergarten, and Rosa Luxemburg was killed uh, 100 meters here uh, before of the hotel, yeah, shot in the head. Yeah. And then uh, they came here with the car, stopped here, and throw her in the Landwehr Canal. The killing of uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Karl Liebknecht wo uh, was one of the greatest tragedies in uh, uh, the uh, history of uh, Germany, uh, because um, the splitting of the proletarian movement was uh, so big that they didn't come together again. Huh? And later on, in 1933, uh, they didn't have the power to fight together against fascism. The paramilitary forces who murdered Rosa Luxemburg would later go on to form the vanguard of the Nazi party. And after her death, the SPD government continued to crack down on its own citizens until the revolution was finally defeated. Rosa Luxemburg lived and died with the hopes of the German Revolution, and the forces of reaction unleashed against her would eventually form the basis of the violent, militarized state known to history as the Third Reich. Paul Levy later wrote that it was here that German fascism began its unearthly train of the dead that dragged on for years and years. but her ideas couldn't be so readily crushed. Her work continues to influence struggles all across the world. And each year, thousands gather to heap flowers on her grave to remember her extraordinary life and her message that humanity has an inherent yearning for freedom, one which can't be put down with rifles. These were her final words, written just hours before the soldiers came knocking on her door. Order prevails in Berlin. You foolish lackeys, your order is built on sand. Tomorrow the revolution will rise up again, clashing its weapons. And to your horror it will proclaim, I was, I am, I shall be.